Donovan Ripkemer is the um, principal of Place Economics. He's based in Washington and his firm um, is a development consulting firm and it's at the nexus of historic preservation and economics. In the US, Donovan has worked with such groups as the Urban Land Institute and the Mayor's Institute on City Design and the American Planning Association. International clients have included the World Bank, the European Development Bank and the United Nations Development Program. I've picked out the eyes of his CV because he's an he's amazing calibre um, and the things that he's been doing. He's, amongst other things, on the board of directors of Global Urban Development, where he co-chairs the Committee on Celebrating Our Urban Heritage. He's also a senior advisory board member of the Global Heritage Fund. He's authored numerous publications, including a book entitled The Economics of Historic Preservation, A Community Leader's Guide. In 2012, he received the Louise DuPont Crown and Shield Award, and I'm not sure whether I've said that correctly, but it is America's highest um, award honoring um, preservation, um, contribution towards um, historic preservation. And he was awarded a lifetime contribution um, for his, his input in historic preservation in the United States. So Donovan, I hope that you can hear me, and there you are. Uh, for a long time, uh, internationally, there was a little uh, suspicion about talking about economics and heritage conservation in the same sentence. It was kind of deemed declassé, that it wasn't appropriate, uh, but that really changed in the last a few years. And recently, even in Europe, they have uh, really made this link between uh, uh, culture and economics. And what's very interesting to me is, is this sentence from their recent publication that the economic benefits of cultural heritage have most commonly been seen in terms of tourism, uh, as you've just heard a great presentation on tourism, but it's also now seen as an innovative stimulant for growth and employment in a wide range of traditional and new industries, and I'm going to try to talk about some of those new industries. Uh, the, the, the sheer fact of, uh, of restoring a historic building uh, is a major local economic impact because it's a labor-intensive activity. Uh, in the U.S., kind of rule of thumb is new construction will be half labor and half materials, where rehabilitation will be 60 to 70 percent labor with the balance being materials. In the U.S. state of Georgia, we did a study a couple years ago, and there's, a, there's an economic model that says if you have a million dollars worth of output from a given industry, what does that mean in terms of numbers of jobs created and the paychecks that those jobs uh, have? Well, if in the U.S. state of Georgia, uh, you manufacture a million dollars worth of automobiles, that's three and a half jobs and a little less than a quarter million in payroll. Uh, if you uh, 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 process a million dollars worth of chickens, it's about 10 jobs and about 426,000 of income. You build a new building for a million dollars, and that's about 15 jobs and 600,000 in income. But you spend that million dollars rehabilitating a historic building, 18 jobs and 750,000 in income. Uh, but it's not just in the US. Uh, in Norway, they've done a great deal of research in this area and have found that, uh, that rehabilitation Rehabilitation is about 16% more labor intensive uh, than is new construction. But it's not even limited to the developing world. The German aid agency, GTZ, has funded a lot of work in the West Bank and Palestine. And one of the great local NGOs there is the Rewalk Center. They've done work on the rehabilitation, but the numbers are the same. That 60 to 70 percent of those German investment dollars in heritage in Palestine uh, go to labor, uh, so it's local jobs being created. Uh, then there's the jobs in the kind of high end uh, of the, the artisan level at conservation craftsmanship. Uh, but in the, even a place like the United Kingdom, where we all look to, is there is a great uh, a resource of uh, heritage buildings. They've identified that they have a severe skill shortage in the heritage area, that new recruits into the industry are not adequately prepared, insufficient numbers of people going into the field, that nearly all of the people in the field consider that there's a shortage of architects and engineers uh, in heritage, and two-thirds of the work that's being done to those historic buildings are be is being carried out by people, in fact, who don't have the right skills and materials. 
Uh, then there's the work on the decorative arts. Uh, these two photographs, one from Vietnam and one from India, these craftsmen working on heritage buildings. And then to get to the heritage buildings, you have to make the, the widgets that go or incorporated into those buildings, like this craftsman uh, in Bahrain. Uh, then there's this issue of infrastructure, that where the historic buildings are, almost by definition, is where existing infrastructure exists. Now, periodically, like here in Indonesia, it has to be replaced, uh, but it's there to begin with. Uh, a study done here in the United States found that preservation projects, the reuse of an existing building, saves between 50 in 80% in infrastructure investment as compared to building a new building at the water lines, sewer lines, curbs and gutters. Uh, then an area that, that really is a very costly one, both in terms of money and environmental quality around the world, is landfill savings. That when we tear down a historic building, it has to go someplace, and that goes to the landfill. Well, I don't know what it is in Australia, but in the U.S. and Europe, between a quarter and a third of everything that goes to the landfill is from construction debris. And much of that is buildings that have been uh, torn down. In China today, uh, the buildings usually have about a 30-year life. And a couple, the last year for which there's data, they produce... 2 billion tons of construction waste. That again is very costly in terms of not just money, but environmental quality. Uh, and then in a consistent use around the world uh, for heritage buildings is their role in a center city revitalization. Much of my work for the last 30 years has been in downtown revitalization, and at least in North America. I'd be hard pressed to identify a single sustained example of center city revitalization where they didn't use the heritage resources as part of that effort. A couple years ago, the Inter-American Development Bank, who has been funding in Latin America heritage-based center city revitalization uh, for some time, uh, but they decided they better look and see if, in fact, this works or not. And so they commissioned a dozen or so studies, just not only ones that they'd funded in Latin America, but ones around the world. And you can see the, the cities, uh, different economies, different continents, different cultures, different everything. The only thing these cities had in common is that they had a heritage-based center city revitalization effort. And regardless of all the differences, there was a commonality of those success stories that there was more private investment, there was middle class moving back into the center city that largely had left it uh, years ago, property values going up, more businesses, higher tax generation. I know most of you are mayors, and that's a key issue. Uh, better property maintenance and lower vacancy. And that list is really things that you measure economic development from, but they were generated from heritage-based center city revitalization. Then there's this issue about uh, civic identity and competitiveness. We no longer live in a world where one city competes with a, a city in the next province or even in the next country. Every city literally is competing with every other city uh, around the globe. And a couple of years ago, I was in uh, the Netherlands for the Dutch culture ministry and met a guy who's not a conservation guy at all. He's a he's an uh, econometric modeling numbers geek. But he had, had acquired a very large database about uh, patterns of direct foreign investment. When a firm based in Sydney makes an investment in Tokyo or one, one based in New Delhi makes an investment in Brisbane. This is all what his, his documents track. Well, over the last a couple of years, uh, there's been a, uh, a set of theories in the economic development world. And the first is that contrary to jobs, people went where jobs were, uh, that today, particularly for the knowledge class workers, uh, jobs are following people. People are going, particularly young knowledge workers, are going where they choose to live. They choose to live on quality of life factors, and the jobs are following them there. Well, those of us in the heritage world have always claimed that heritage is one of those quality of life components. Well, if we're right, and if that pattern is right, then there ought to be more examples of foreign direct investment in places with strong heritage cities. So in collaboration, with this Erasmus University, we created a research methodology, and it was this. 
we identified European cities that met two tests. They were World Heritage Cities, and they also belonged to the Organization of World Heritage Cities, meaning they sort of recognized that that is an asset. Uh, there were 29 of those. And then my, my colleague, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, economic modeling guy, identified comparable cities uh, that were similar Similar to those 29 in size, in geography, in density, in poverty levels, in environmental, all kinds of ranges, so that the single difference that was left was it was or it was not meeting this, uh, this heritage city uh, test and compared the instances of direct foreign investment. And, and over the 10 year period that he looked at the data, uh, in fact, those heritage cities uh, typically uh, had 41 more more instances of direct foreign investment than did their twin uh, non-heritage cities. And that's really a significantly, statistically significant pattern of preference uh, for those kind of cities. Then there's the issue of density. Uh, I don't know how many of your cities in South Australia are de dealing with uh, density issues, but in many places of the world, there's this great urban growth, there's a recognized need that there has to be an increase in density uh, in those cities. And I think that's pretty prima facie true. Well, what's happening today in New York City is the real estate industry is really pushing density for their own grounds, but they're saying, look, New York is fixed in, in uh, boundaries. Uh, it's going to grow, and the only way we can grow is grow up, meaning that we have to build skyscrapers so we can have more density. And when skyscrapers are built, there's no question in New York City they add density. That we've looked at the at the at the census block, which is the lowest in the US, the lowest geographic area that the census data uh, includes, it's usually five or six city blocks. In, in the la over the, uh, the, since, uh, the last 15 years, this, the residential towers have been built in Manhattan. Uh, the density number of people living per square mile before it was built, about 9,700 per square mile. After the skyscrapers were built, 104,000 per square mile. So yes, did those skyscrapers add density? Yes, they added a lot of density. However, or is already the densest part in the city. In New York City, a very dense place. In fact, it's not where the skyscrapers are. It's the historic districts in the uh, city of New York. In the case of Manhattan, the density in the historic districts is 145,000 people per square mile. The densest place are those, those uh, uh, pedestrian friendly, uh, appropriate scale historic districts, not the high rises. In fact, in all five of the boroughs in the city of New York, the same pattern holds true. The densest place is, in fact, the historic districts in those five boroughs. Uh, then this issue about competitiveness and, and differentiation here in uh, Moscow and in Athens and in uh, Agra and in, uh, in uh, Bahia, uh, Salvador Bahia, Brazil, in Hanoi, of them are in fact being competitive by using their uh, historic resources. This great vertical exit trade center. Uh, and then this issue about historic buildings as venues for the fine arts. Now, would the collection of the Louvre be the same if we're in some concrete block building? Well, maybe the collection would be the same, but would be the experience be the same? Absolutely not. Uh, the venue for the performing arts, like this opera house that the fifth graders are visiting uh, in Vienna or this arts district is using historic buildings as a place to sell arts and crafts uh, in Quito in Ecuador. Or here is uh, Madrid, where the context of those historic buildings make the place the appropriate venue for those street performers. It's a real pattern of historic cities attracting the creative classes. This painter is in the US historic city of New Orleans. Uh, a city in the U.S., Raleigh, North Carolina, and Raleigh, like Adelaide, is the, is the state, the provincial capital. And their state economic development strategy said we have to add workers, increase our share of the workforce that's in the kind of the creative classes in arts, entertainment, and recreation. Now, any place, this is never going to be a huge chunk of the labor force, but it's a, it's a portion that can have a big catalytic effect on other activities. Well, in the state of North Carolina, a little less than 2% of the uh, workforce is in the uh, arts and entertainment. In the city of Raleigh, that's the capital city, and in the 
inventor of a, both the research triangle and a number of universities, a little over 2%. We have a strange system in the, in the US. We have things that are called national register districts, and they're kind of an honorary designation, but there's no protections whatsoever that comes from a national register district. The protections, and that means the constraints, the regulations, the limitations, come where there are, is a local historic district. So the national register districts in Raleigh have more of those workers in arts and entertainment than does the city as a whole, but where they're mostly concentrated, in fact, is in these local historic districts. This is the city of San Antonio in Texas, sixth largest city in the United States, home of the Alamo. Uh, last year, that uh, San Antonio got uh, a dozen of their missions, their Spanish colonial missions, uh, put on the World Heritage List. These purple areas are historic districts in downtown San Antonio, and the circles are concentration of of uh, uh, arts-related businesses. And what you can see is they're not, it's not that they're all in those historic districts, but clearly they're clustered in and around those historic places. There is this natural connection uh, between arts and, and culture and historic buildings. This again is the, is the city of New York. The, the historic districts, the local historic districts in New York City uh, constitute, hold about 8% of all of the jobs in the city, but 10% of the professional scientific jobs in the knowledge field, 13, 14% of the information jobs, 14% of the educational services, and look at the last one, 20% of here, one of the cultural capitals of the world, and 20% of all of the uh, arts, recreation, and entertainment jobs in the city of New York are in fact in those historic districts that as a whole only count 8% of all the jobs. This, this use of historic areas to attract and anybody who doesn't understand that the young are critical to economic development in a city don't understand what's happening in development, developing countries around the world. And then this very interesting pattern that I've seen in everywhere, and that is this issue of young women, brides, getting their bridal pictures taken in front of a historic building. Now think about what that means. Here, one of the most important days in this young woman's life, and she's trying to make a connection in that photograph between not just this important day, but for the kind of continuity of the place she lives. This is a China and Vietnam and Israel. It doesn't make any difference. The same pattern is being followed. Uh, these uh, historic buildings often constitute the context, provide the context as this gathering place for families. Uh, the context for active street life, like here in Paris, or for passive street life, like here in Quito. Uh, or just a place, this historic buildings, this context, to just watch the world go by, like here in Athens. And again, the best historic cities are not, not museums, they're not frozen in place. Uh, the best historic cities evolve and change over time. Here is a Lille in northern France where a wonderful new building uh, is reflecting the uh, heritage building uh, across the street. A pattern of, of using heritage buildings for small town revitalization, like this small town in Slovakia. Uh, and then this kind of role that heritage buildings have as part of, of education. Here in Cuenca, Spain, these elementary kids learning about their city's culture the same day in the same place that high school students were learning uh, uh, just more advanced lessons in the same story. Uh, the educational uh, venue for uh, university education, like this uh, Australian uh, university. Uh, housing for the wealthy, housing for the professional class, housing for the middle class, housing for the working class are all around the world, in fact, accommodated in uh, historic buildings. Now, you all know, because Australia suffered like the rest of the world, that uh, starting in 2008, there was a big real estate crash uh, started in the U.S. and then affected every place around the world. And so we thought it was important to look at what was the effect on these local historic districts uh, where and there was the real estate crash. And we've now lowered the rate in half of what it was in the rest of the city. And these, by the way, some of these were very, very rich. The difference that 
of a, a much lower foreclosure rate, which there's this latent market. Small and young businesses to be in those historic districts. Out there, this again um, is uh, San Antonio, where there's this concentration um, of small firms uh, in and around the uh, historic districts. Uh, well, once again, we're back to um, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And Raleigh is a city with a real significant uh, development in their downtown and lots of new construction. Uh, and but where are the new businesses starting up in Raleigh? Almost half of them are in historic buildings in downtown Raleigh and another quarter in older buildings that haven't been designated historic. Historic buildings as the location for specialty product businesses like uh, here in Barcelona or for food and wine businesses like in uh, Lisbon or the, the this role that historic buildings provide for the creation of crafts. There's this there's this relationship between the crafts and historic building that gives an authenticity uh, to that uh, product. So here in uh, Aleppo in Syria, in Manama in Bahrain, in uh, 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 northern Thailand and in Vietnam, the same answer. They're creating local products in historic buildings. This context for the informal economy, like here in Latin America, but also for luxury buildings businesses like in Naples and then this issue about uh, this here we have a 21st century transportation center this is Lille France it's turned itself as an old industrial city into the major uh, European rail transportation center and it steps away from its 19th century uh, a city and a half a mile between from its uh, medieval city uh, increasingly historic buildings have become the the uh, uh, a context for public-private partnerships uh, around uh, the world. One of the great heritage building uh, public-private partnerships is actually in Auckland in uh, New Zealand, the, the Brit Mart uh, complex. Then there's a lot of recent uh, analysis in the environment about this connection. Uh, an uh, environmental economist and an uh, investment banker in the state of Maryland, which is right next to me in Washington, D.C., uh, and they looked at the uh, choices between if we used a 50,000 square feet historic warehouse, fixed it up, make it environmentally uh, responsible, uh, energy efficient, or built a new building of 50,000 square feet, what would be the different environmental uh, consequences? 20 to 40 percent reduction in vehicle miles traveled, uh, lower CO2 uh, emissions, less construction debris, saved infrastructure expenditures. Uh, in New York City, where they did an audit of all of the office buildings in the city, in fact, the ones that were using the least energy per square foot, not the new green gizmo buildings, but in fact, the buildings built uh, prior to 1930. Uh, the U.S. National Trust has a research arm called the uh, Green Lab. Uh, and what they found uh, comparing uh, new buildings, energy efficient new buildings, with uh, uh, rehabilitating existing buildings is that in fact uh, it takes almost 80 years frequently to make up for the environmental cost of building one of those damn green buildings. Uh, and most of them won't stand for 80 years. Almost every building typology in almost every region of the country, the better environmental choice was rehabilitating an existing building. Uh, in New York City, the, single, the residential, the apartment buildings, one uh, built 
after 1980 uses 13% more energy per square foot than one built before 1920. Uh, heritage tourism, and you've heard about that, so I'm not going to talk about it uh, much, uh, but it's a major factor in many American cities. And what's, what we found is that in all of the five categories where tourists spend their money, lodging, transportation, food and beverage, retail and recreation, heritage visitors outspend uh, people who went to that city and did no heritage activities. In fact, what's a consistent pattern around the world is it's often a heritage site that attracts visitors, but that site only gets about 7% of the money that, that tourist spends, the real beneficiaries are the restaurants, the hotel, the gas station, and the retail shop. So those are some of the ways that heritage contributes to the economy. There's many, many more. Uh, good luck, and thank you very much for having me. Oh, the last thing I want to tell you, and it's available, uh, uh, downloadable, is that the, the World Bank published a book called The Economic of Uniqueness about the whole range of the contributions of heritage to the economy. So thanks very much.